there? <laughs> well, as Kim said, my name's Andy. Uh, Andy DeHoog is my name. And uh, yeah, she said uh, uh, that I'm the executive pastor with Shoe Swap Community Church, or SCC. And um, in case you don't know what that means, um, it means things like uh, the announcement about the Constitution of Bylaws that kind of perks my ears up because it's those kinds of things that, that I kind of go, oh, Constitution bylaws, I know about that, you know, and, and policies and uh, just some of the administrative uh, back end kind of stuff uh, to do with the church. Um, that's kind of my, my area. I've been with SEC now for uh, five and a half years and uh, working out of the Salmon Arm campus. And um, it's a great privilege for me to be here. I don't often get to be here in Sycamus, and particularly not in this building. This is a whole new, very unique thing that's been going on here this summer, and it's great to see it with my own eyes. And, um, but I, I'm often usually in Salmon Arm, and these days actually often in Sorrento. And uh, for those of you SCC people, in case you're not aware, um, we find ourselves in pastoral transition as well. Uh, as you all in uh, SBC find yourselves as well. Um, we, we're in transition in, in our Sorrento campus there. And so um, I would just uh, call on, on the church and call on all of you to be just be praying for your brothers and sisters uh, there in Sorrento and that God would, uh, would lead both SBC and SCC Sorrento uh, in, in this time of transition and that God would bring just the right person at just the right time according to his will and according to his plan. So um, anyways, great to, uh, to be here. I want to also just echo uh, the announcement that Jermico uh, gave uh, in particular to SCC folks that next week is our annual summit service. And I, besides Easter, to me, it's like the best service of the year. It's like 500 people in the park down at the wharf in Salmon Arm. And uh, we have a, a, a service there, and the music's loud, and we annoy the people at the Prestige Hotel, but oh well, that's fine. And, uh, and we have burgers and hot dogs after, and ice cream, and it's just an awesome time. And, and I know that you'll have to get ready for church ne- uh, 20 minutes earlier than normal, but I'm sure you can probably handle that. So I hope to see all of you there uh, next week uh, down at the Wharf in Salmon Arm. We're going to go to the Word uh, this morning. And uh, I would encourage you to open your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And please do turn there. You're going to want to follow along. I'm kind of a, a very systematic, verse-by-verse, teaching-style kind of preacher. And so um, please do follow along in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And um, we're eventually going to kind of focus in, kind of drill down to verse 15 is where we're going to land, and I have some points uh, on that, Um, but I want to uh, put that one verse in its larger context, and and you'll see what I mean in just a moment, but really what I want to do today, and I think the songs that we've just been singing fit so well. Um, I don't know if you knew the theme of what I was going to be preaching on, but like so many words that we sang today just fit so well with what I want to say um, from, from the Word of God today. And I just simply want to turn our attention to the cross today. That's where I want us to go. I want us to go to the cross, to see the cross, and to see the impact of the cross in, in the world in, in general, in, in the grand scheme of things, but also the, the implications of the cross to us personally. That's what I want us to see today. You know, the cross is the, of course, the central event in history. That's the central event in Christianity. Um, However, it would seem, and you probably know this, um, that the cross, the significance and the the prominence of the cross in our culture today has been reduced, I would say, more than somewhat. Would you agree with that? Okay. The cross, of course, is a widely recognized symbol. You see people wearing crosses. You see um, crosses and very used in various ways. It's a recognized symbol. You know, it's right alongside things like Nike and, and Apple and Coca-Cola and Mercedes-Benz and Starbucks and Chanel and the peace symbol and, and all of these different symbols. You know, people would recognize, oh, you know, they would see the, the shape of the cross and they go, oh, that's, that's the cross. But marketing research has indicated that more North Americans 
when asked to name significant symbols, would name the golden arches before they could name the cross as a significant symbol. And who can blame them, right? We're not, we're not judging. We're just, that's just a recognition that that's, that's an indicator of our, of our culture today. And so today here in, in this context, in our church, churches, I want us to go to the cross and answer this question. What's the cross for? What's the cross for? What, what does it mean to us in our lives today? What, what did it mean for the world? What did it mean for the, for the grand scheme of things, of, of life in general? What's the cross for? What, what is its purpose? What are its implications? And as I said, I want to drill down to verse 15, but I want to put verse 15 in context. So we're going to look at the larger section here of, of verses 11 through 21. And, and as I said, you want to follow along, we're going to go uh, pretty much verse by verse here. And so Paul is writing to a church. He's writing to the Corinthians, the Corinthian church in particular. And he's, and this is a second letter to them. And he's talking here about the ministry of reconciliation. In verse 11, he starts off and he says, therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. In other words, he's saying that because we know God, knowing the, knowing the fear of the Lord, that because we know God and because we have some level of understanding of our humble, yet in Christ, and here's, here's irony, right? It's, it's, we have a humble position, yet in Christ we have an elevated position in him. Knowing that, knowing the fear of the Lord, then we ought to what? We ought to persuade others. In other words, there ought to be a, a result there ought to be an overflow, a, a sharing of what we know and love. The cross, as, as believers, as Christians, the cross should motivate us to be a witness in both word and in deed. And then he goes on and he says, but what we are is known to God and I hope it is known also to your conscience. He says, what we are is known to God. Listen, people. There is nothing hidden from God. What we are, who we are, deep down inside, what, what people see on the outside and what we know on the inside, all of that is, is known to God. Nothing is hidden from Him. God knows us for the sinners that we are. There's no secret before God. And then further he goes on, he says, and I hope it is known also to your conscience. So we ought to be aware of ourselves and of our sin. And you know, I don't know about you, but I haven't reached perfection yet. And I struggle against sin. We all do, right? I mean, as Christians, we've, the, the penalty of sin has been removed, but we, we still exist in the, the presence of sin. We still battle that. We still fight that battle every day. And, you know, for me, when I think about my own life, I think that sometimes it's not necessarily... Now hear me on this, okay? Don't misunderstand, but it's not the actual sin that's, that's quite as concerning as the lack of awareness of sin. Now don't get me wrong, sin is concerning. We, we absolutely need to be aware of, of the severity of sin and how it, it displeases God. But what I, what I think about in my own life more, even more so, is God, make me aware of that sin. Make me conscious what are my blind spots? What am I not seeing? What am I, what, what, what is, what am I not seeing in, in the spiritual realm? We need to be uh, absolutely conscious of sin, as I said. But we also need to understand that, that God forgives us our sin. That He cleanses us from all unrighteousness. That He gives us grace and His grace abounds. Not for us to abuse that grace, but He gives us grace. Um, it would seem to me, and I know I experienced this in my own life, maybe you can relate, but there can be a bit of a problem with trying to self-justify our sin, right? And, then, and this goes for, what, for, for Christians and non-Christians like, whether you're a believer here today or you're not, sometimes we try to, to minimize and self-justify our sin, right? Do you know what I mean? Like we say, oh, well, it's, it's just this. Or it's just that. Or it's just, it's just a little bit. It's just a little bit. Well, I, 
I would like to think that, you know, if there was just a little bit of manure in some brownies that I gave you, you probably might have a problem with that, right? <laughs> Too often we try to min minimize, we try to self-justify. And listen, brothers and sisters, that's impossible. To self, we are not justified by ourselves. That, that's impossible. We can't do that. We are only justified by Christ and by his work on the cross. That's verse 11. He goes on in verse 12. He says, we are not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you cause to boast about us so that you may be able to answer those who boast about outward appearance and not about what is in the heart. What is Paul talking about here? What is he saying? Well, in short, he's basically, this for Paul, this is a, a necessary self-defense of his ministry. Okay? He talks about outward appearance. And um, we know that that... In this time, this is like 2,000 years ago, okay? In this time, Greek philosophers, religious leaders, um, including the Pharisees, of which Paul was one at one time, they would have been quite concerned about outward appearances, right? But what, what people looked like and how they were externally following the law. That would have been a very um, uh, primary concern for them. Jesus talks about this in uh, not-so-nice Words in a not so nice way in uh, Matthew 23, verses 27 and 28. He says, he's talking to religious leaders, okay? He says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. That's pretty strong language, right? He calls them hypocrites. For you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. So you out, also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. And so really what Paul wanted, what he's trying to say to the Corinthians here is he wants them to know the motivation of his heart. He wants them to know that he's not concerned. It's not about externals, that he's not just putting on a good show, that he's not just saying the right things and doing the right things. He wants them to know that the motivations of his heart are pure that he's motivated essentially by, by Jesus and by his work on the cross. And he goes on, verse 13. He says, for the love... Sorry. Verse 13. For if we are uh, beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. Well, that's an interesting verse. What's he saying there? I like to summarize it this way. That he's basically saying, look, we're, we're crazy about God. We're crazy for God. We love God, but we're stable for you. Um, I saw this sort of, I think, um, in action uh, at a conference I went to a number of years back, and it was quite a large Christian conference, ministry conference, and several thousand people there. And um, I was there by myself, and it was, it was kind of bizarre. But anyways, um, the thing I noticed about the people there, and it stuck with me. This is, this is going back... Um, 10, 15 years now. But it stuck with me that what I saw in the people there were people who were um, radical for God. They were, as we would say sometimes in the church, in our Christianese, that they were on fire. You know, you say that to somebody who's not in the church and they're like, on fire? My goodness, call the fire department, put them out, right? Like it's just... But these people were, were on fire. They were radical for God. They were sold out. They were exuberant and passionate in their worship and their faith. Yet at the same time, they were so normal, you know, so down to earth, just so, so just not flaky, not a bunch of weirdos, right? And, and they would provide, as Paul wanted to do for the Corinthians, a, a positive testimony for the Corinthian church. That, that was Paul's heart here. He didn't want to provide a negative testimony on behalf of uh, the Corinthians. Verse 14 and 15, I won't comment. We're going to come back to that. I'll just read it for now. For the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. Verse 16, from now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we, were, we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus 
no longer. In other words, he's saying that we don't look on outward appearance anymore. We don't judge books by their covers. We don't look at the externals. That's not the most important thing. We don't even look at Christ that way anymore. You know, some, some of his disciples, some of, of Jesus' early disciples, would have regarded Christ with a very earthly, very temporal, very sort of fleshly kind of mindset. Some of his early disciples um, thought that his purpose in, in being there was to overthrow the Romans and establish a more powerful, a more earthly kingdom. But if that's all he came for, then that was a complete waste of time. Okay? Because that's, that's history. We see, you know, one kingdom rises up, another one takes over, and another one takes over, and that's not what Jesus came for. He explained it in John 18. He says, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from the world. And also in, in 1 Samuel 16, 7, we read that the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. So you see the kingdom of God is so far beyond and so much more than we see with our physical eyes. That's what Paul's saying here. Verse 16. Verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Christians are given a new heart. We were singing about that this morning. That we've been redeemed. That we're not like we used to be. The old has passed and the new has come. We as Christians are given a new heart, a new mindset, a new perspective a whole new outlook. And if you haven't experienced that, then I would just encourage you to, to ask God for that. To go to him and say, God, I, wa I want that. I want that new mindset. I want that new heart. I want that new perspective. I, wanna, I want the old to pass away and I want the new to come into my life. Would you go to God with that this morning? Verse 18 and 19. All this is from God who through Christ, reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. We are reconciled to God, and then we are given a message and ministry to also do the same. You know, often Jesus expects us to give what we've been given to do what has been done to us. And we've, if we've been given redemption, if we've been given reconciliation with, with God, then we're expected to go and do the same, to go and, and reconcile with others and to share that message of reconciliation with God with all that we meet. In verse 20, Therefore we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. We are to go and give what we have been given. And this brings us almost full circle back to, to verse 11 where we started, where Paul says, therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. We persuade others. And then finally, verse 21. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So Jesus, the only one without sin actually became sin it says so you could name your sin right what, what are you wrestling against what are you battling against what what sin did you struggle with this week what are you what are you currently fighting against in that way Na name that sin and jesus became it so that so that in him we might become his righteousness not our own righteousness because we have none of that. We don't have any of that. We become his righteousness. It's all about Jesus and about the glory of God. So I, I still want to get to, down to verse 15. But why, why look at the whole section? Well, because I want to put it all in context. And because something in every single one of those verses points us to the cross today. You know, when Paul talks about persuading others, well, persuading them about what? Persuading them about the cross. 
He talks about being conscious of sin. What makes us conscious of sin? The cross. What was the motivation in Paul's heart? This is verse 12. It was the cross. Why didn't Paul want a negative testimony for the church? Because of the glory of the cross. Why don't we regard Christ according to the flesh anymore? That's verse 16. It's because of the cross, because of the death and resurrection of Christ. How does one become new? How do we become new creations in Christ? By identifying with Christ on the cross. That's that's what he means when he says the old has passed. And then identifying with his resurrection, the new has come. That's why we baptize people, right? Now, I know SBC, you're all alliance, but we're Baptists. And I know we, we have, I think, the same belief when it comes to baptism. That's why we baptize people, because it's, it's that picture. It's, that, it's that, um, that outward picture of, of, you know, you go down, you're, you're identifying with the death, and then you're coming up into new life, and you're identifying with his resurrection. How are we reconciled to God? That's verse 18 and 20. We're reconciled through the cross. Why are our trespasses not counted against us because of the cross? How do we become the righteousness of God? By Christ's work on the cross. You see, it's all about the cross. And so now that we have that context, I want us to turn to the cross and answer that question. What's it for? What's it for? Now, this is not a comprehensive answer, theologically speaking. You know, the theology of the cross is is incredibly complex and dynamic. But I see in this one verse, in verse 15, four answers to that question, what's the cross for? And I'll just read the, the verses there in just a minute here. Verse 14, For the love of Christ controls us because we've concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. In verse 15, here's the key. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. So I see four answers to the question, what's the cross for there? And if you're a note taker, you can write write these down. The first one, number one, that the cross is for God's glory. The cross is for God's glory. It says there in verse 15, it says that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for Him. But for Him. The cross is for God's glory. Now somehow, over time, it would seem to me that a very selfish and a very sort of skewed gospel, and I'll put it in, in, in air quotes because it's not really gospel at all. It's, um, like the gospel's good news, right? It's really good news. But this sort of false gospel that, I wanna, that I'm talking about here is, is actually very bad news. And it's, the, it's a gospel that says that it's all about me. And you know what? If my life and if, about, and if, if you know, salvation is all about me, that's very bad news because I am powerless to save myself, let alone anyone else. So that's why I say it's, it's not really gospel at all. That, that's, it's solely about my benefit and my blessings, about my glory, about the betterment of my life. Listen, brothers and sisters, it's not your life in the first place. It's not your life in the first place. If you're a Christian, if you're a believer, then you have been purchased by the blood of Christ. And this gospel, this false gospel, tells us that we should never lack anything we want that we should never be sick. And let me tell you, that's just not true. That's just not true. That is not gospel at all. That is, that is uh, something else altogether. And so the cross is not primarily about me. The cross is primarily for God's glory. Now, it's not to make God glorious, you know, because he already is. He always was, always will be. It's not to make him that, but it's simply to reveal, to honor to promote his glory. And so, yes, yes, we absolutely benefit from the cross. And that's going to be point number two here. We absolutely benefit. But I think the more primary purpose of the cross is to glorify God. So that's point number one. The cross is for God's glory. Number two, and this is where it gets into the implications to us personally. Number two is that the cross is for freedom. The cross is for freedom. It says there in verse 15, 
that who for their sake. Who's the there he's talking about? Well, in particular, he's Paul is writing to the, the Corinthians, but this the there, if you're a Christian here today, this is you. This is you. Who who for their sake? Who's there? You and me, if, if we're believers today. Who for their sake? So the cross is for freedom. The cross has an implication in my life, and that is for my personal freedom. Freedom from what? Freedom from sin, of course. Also, freedom from ourselves. Freedom from ourselves. We are often, I don't know if you agree with this or not, but I I experience this in my own life, that I am often the master of my own demise, right? I'm often my own worst enemy. I'm often the source of my own burdens. Listen, we do it to ourselves, don't we? You know, when we're, when we talk about being busy and the burden of being busy, and I think about in my, at least for me, who made me busy? Me, right? We put our own burdens on ourselves. We do it to ourselves. Listen, and when it comes to sin, we, we always have a choice, don't we? We always have a choice. The Bible talks about there's always a way of escape. When we face temptation, there's always a way out. There's always a way of escape. We have a choice to sin or not to sin. Crosses for freedom. John Piper, Pastor John Piper, puts it this way. See if you can follow this. He says, Christ died for my sake so that for his sake... I might no longer live for my sake, but for his. You follow that? I'm going to read it one more time. Christ died for my sake so that for his sake, I might no longer live for my sake, but for his. I could shorten it to this, that he died for me so that I don't have to live for me. I can have freedom from myself. In Christ, we are free to live for him, not for ourselves. You know, Jesus said that his yoke was what? Easy. Easy. And that his burden is like, you know what we put on ourselves? We put heavy burdens on ourselves and we take upon yokes that are hard. But because of the cross, there's freedom from that. So that's number two. The cross is for freedom. Number three, the cross is for resurrection. It says there in verse 15 that Jesus died and was raised. He died. Now we're talking about the cross today, of course, and we, we associate... Um, the cross primarily with death, of course. But we must absolutely remember that Christ not only died, but was raised. And it's the resurrection that separates Jesus from everybody else. It's the resurrection that separates Jesus from other teachers, from other philosophers, from other prophets, from the apostles themselves. It's the resurrection that, that, that makes him so distinct in that sense. A number of years ago, when we were living uh, down in the lower mainland still, um, we hosted university students in, in our home. And this one semester, just, just for one semester, we hosted a young man from Saudi Arabia who was a Muslim. And uh, that was really interesting. I really enjoyed that. He was a really good guy and uh, very talkative. We had no issues with him, um, you know, being from from that country and, and being a devout Muslim, you know, morality was very high. We had, we had no issues that way. And uh, just a, an awesome guy. His name was Faisal. And uh, I remember this one time, you know, so I'm, I'm a pastor, right? And he's this Muslim and he's living in my house. And it's just this weird combo that was going on. And uh, he saw my Bible one time, you know, and he's like, well, what's that? What's that book? And I said, well, it's, it's, it's my Bible. Bible. What's that? You know, like, it's, Saudi Arabia is so close. He didn't, he didn't know what a Bible was. It was unbelievable. He had never, never heard of this thing. And you know, so I tried to explain it. And I said, well, it's, it's um, you know, it's like our, it's our scriptures. It's like our holy book. Oh, oh, okay, I can, I can understand that. His next question was, well, what's it about? <laughs> and basically I said, well, it's about Jesus. Jesus. You know, now, now, he's, now he's heard that name before. He knows Jesus as a prophet. Muslims know Jesus as a prophet. And um, he said, well, 
how could it possibly be all about Jesus? Why would it possibly be all about Jesus? That doesn't make any sense. And um, I said, well, basically everything in there, you know, you're not going to see the name of Jesus all throughout, but basically everything in there is pointing to Christ. It's pointing to Jesus. It's pointing to the cross and, and the resurrection. And he couldn't understand this because in his worldview, in his um, religion and way of thinking, um, Jesus was a prophet who lived and died. I don't think they even believe he died on the cross. I think he, he just sort of lived and died like a, normal, like a normal man. And, you know, end of story. There was no understanding of the resurrection. Jesus was a prophet and no more. But of course, we know the truth that Jesus died on the cross, that he miraculously was raised three days later, and that because of that, we can have new life. That, listen, we, we are dead in our sins, right? Apart from Christ, we are, we're dead in our sins. And we've been crucified as such. And that's what Paul means when he says, therefore all have died. But then we are raised to life in him as Jesus was raised. We are raised to abundant life here and now and then also to eternal life. So that's number three. The cross is for resurrection. And finally, number four, the cross is for all. The cross is for all. It says there that he died for all. And over in verse 19, it says, that is in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. 1 Timothy 2, 3 and 4, this is good and is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. We were singing about this this morning, right? Come to the table, all, all of you. In John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And so we see there that the cross, the cross is for all. It's inclusive, right? Yet, yet at the same time, it's exclusive in the sense that, that Jesus is the only way, right? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. So it's inclusive, and yet we know at the same time that not all will be saved. says there in verse 15 that he died for all that those who live and this would indicate to me that not all shall live Luke 9 23 Jesus said that if anyone would come after me let him deny himself and take up his cross that implies that not all will follow Jesus he says if anyone would follow would come after me not all will that's a hard truth. That's a thing we don't like to think about. That's a thing that, that we want to sort of put off, but, but it's true. It's true. But, so what do we do with that? What do we do with that? You know, thinking of ourselves, hopefully as evangelical, as missional, as living out the gospel, and, and uh, you know, our statement with SEC is that we exist to declare and demonstrate. You know, we, we want to be... As Paul says there in verse 11, we persuade others. That's, that's our mission. We have a mission to accomplish. So what do we do with that? Do we go around um, trying to decide whom God is saving? Do we try to figure that out? Well, I think God's saving that person. And Oh, no, not that one. You know, do, No, of course not. Of course we don't do that. Our job as Christians, our mission is to faithfully minister to to all whom God puts in our lives. As Paul said in verse 11, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. Not just some others. Not those that we, that we choose, that we decide, need, need to hear the message of the, of the cross. But we persuade others. So, because we've been given this message, this ministry of reconciliation, then we know that as the church, whether you're SCC or SBC, doesn't matter today, we're the church. Because of that, we know we have a job to do. Our faith is not to remain private, it's to be public. We are to be evangelists according to the grace given to us. Even people like me who, I'm, I'm a natural introvert. 
But I'm called to be an evangelist in the ways that God calls and equips me to do that. We have to share the message of the cross. We have to. We have to. As we close today, I want you to think about two questions. We've, we've looked at the cross, and what it means, what it means to us. And I want you, the, the first question I want you to ask yourself is, what is God saying to me today? I've shared with you my thoughts and some of my, the results of some of my study on this particular text. I've given you my, my take on it. And uh, I hope that maybe something resonated with you. And maybe something, maybe God's saying something to you today. What is God saying to you? What is he putting in your heart? That's the first question. The second question is what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? What are you going to do with it? We are called not to be only hearers, but to be doers of the word. So what is God saying to you? What are you going to do about it? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for the cross. We thank you for your life, for your death, for your resurrection. We thank you, Jesus, that you are, are real, that you are with us, you walk beside us, that you give us life, life abundant here and now and eternal life forever. Jesus, thank you for, for dying on the cross. Thank you for taking my place. Jesus, that should have been me. That should have been me on the cross, but Jesus, you took my place. You paid for the, the, the penalty for my sin. Jesus, thank you. Jesus, thank you for that. I, I, can't, even, I can't even put into words gratitude and praise and adoration. We could try, we could go on and on and on with with words, but it's still never enough. So Jesus, we just simply thank you and we rest in what you have accomplished for us. We rest in that, Lord, that Jesus, you said it is finished. It is finished. So Jesus, thank you for that. And thank you for, for new life. Thank you for life that is empowered by your Holy Spirit. Thank you for equipping us to be ministers and to be messengers of, of reconciliation, of redemption. Jesus, I just pray that uh, you would open our hearts, God, right in this moment and as the week goes on, that you would continue to speak to us and that you would give us opportunity and that we would take the opportunity to put your word into action, Lord. Empower us, equip us. We look to you. We look to the cross. We love you, Jesus. We worship you. We honor you today. We lift up your name. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.